start with a video, and, and this was a video that um, you know, IBM played probably about 10 years ago, um, and, and I really think that it's, it's probably more apropos now than, than it was 10 years ago, and it really ties together you know, kind of what I'm going to talk about, which is going to be you know, blockchain, IoT, and then machine learning. So, you know, a, a, a cute video, right? I remember when I saw it the first time about 10 years ago, I was like, well, there are a lot of things wrong with it. Number one, the boxes aren't going to tell you because you need to have tags in the box, you need to have readers, you need to have some way to get the information you know, from the boxes to a system that is that now going to be able to say, okay, you're on the road to Albuquerque, not Fresno, and then have the help desk appear in the middle of the roadway to tell you you're going the wrong direction. So, you know, obviously you could do this with GPS, but the whole idea here was that this was about kind of an intelligent supply chain. So where 10 years ago we, we didn't have that, I think now we're, we're, we're starting to get to that point to where, you know, we, we have those three things. We, we, we have IoT, right, which, which is the intelligent um, boxes. We, we have a way to get the information to different places, which is blockchain. And then we have, you know, machine learning, which is going to let you know that, okay, the boxes are really supposed to go to Fresno and they're not supposed to go to Albuquerque. So, you know, I've been doing this for about 30 years. I've been in supply chain for a number of retailers and CPG companies. I've been in consulting for, I think it's 22 years. And I found that in the last probably five years, there's been more change in, in retail and even more change in supply chain management than I've ever seen before. Um, everything's different. Um, you know, there is so much more you know, work with the, the consumer. And where it used to be okay to be second, it, it really isn't anymore. There, there is no such thing as a fast follower. And I think we, we see that with a lot of the retailers that are really struggling now, a lot of the store closures, you know, new smaller retailers coming up. And, and, and how that old, whole market is, is working. Um, and supply chain is really a, a big part of it. You know, if, if we kind of take a look at you know, taking all this information that, that we're getting from the consumers, being able to, to synthesize it and then make decisions on it in terms of, of forecasting and inventory and so on, there's really a lot of, of, of money that can be taken out of the supply chain. And supply chain has a, a couple of big areas. It's, you know, there's inventory, transportation costs, and, and really by eliminating a lot of the paperwork, really putting together a, a real exchange of information between you know, the CPG companies and the retailers and even the consumers is, you know, is, is going to take a lot of the mystery out of the supply chain. I mean, right now we have EDI, which is kind of a peer type system, it's worked, but it doesn't really work. So, you know, we're, we're ready to move on to the other things that really connects all of it together. Okay, so the, the three pieces that are really driving it are, are IoT, right? That is the devices that exist that, that will tell you, okay, you know, this is where I am, this is what I am, and, and this is where I'm going. You also have the pieces that are, you know, really your forecasting and your deep learning and then your supply chain, supply chain transparency and, and, and provenance. So it's really about being able to provide the visibility, you know, from the manufacturer to the retailer and, and, and even to the consumer of, of the product, being able to, if you could imagine, um, in a recall situation, and having been retail for, for years and years and years, the way retail re recalls work is, you know, a CPG company or a pharma company says, I need to recall this product. Retailers say, okay, I'm gonna pull everything off, you know, even if it's not the same lot number, and it's, it's typically a, a big mess. You know, can you imagine if you have a recall now and you have your refrigerator or you have your iPhone beep and tell you, hey, your ice cream has just been recalled, you need to bring it back. It's, it's a lot around targeted recall and, and the provenance and even the e-pedigree that's been talked about for so many years. Um, this has some kind of interesting facts on here. Um, you know, industry out of stocks, 8 to 12 percent. Um, I know in some stores they're even higher than that. Right, and with with omnichannel, it's, it's just critical to make sure you have the right product at the right location, and your inventory is absolutely accurate. Um, I'm sure everybody has stories about where it was, and I have one where I tried to buy a fire pit from a, 
um, a, a retailer and you know their inventory was inaccurate and went, ended up going from store to store to store to only find out that you know what, what was on their website what was incorrect. So it's really important to try and make sure that for your customer you know what's there and, and you have not only accurate inventory but you have enough of that inventory. The, the other interesting thing is that you know, two-thirds of promotions don't break even, which, which is kind of a high number. And we did some research back, you know, when RFID was really coming out around promotions and found out that a lot of promotions aren't breaking even because the promotions never make it to the floor on time. So they're still in the back room where the retailer takes and breaks it down into individual components. And, and that by just seeing the product move from the back room to the floor, and being able to follow up on it if it didn't, you know, had, had a huge impact on promotions. But really the, the piece that we see is, is if you take a look at the, the graphic on the right, you know, there are so many different inputs we have of unstructured data that really allow us to, to do what we call hyperlocalization, which is being able to adjust the forecast based upon the specific location that you're in. Um, not just where we're saying, okay, the forecast is gonna be for the Northeast or it's gonna be for New York, or it's going to be for Brooklyn, it's, you know, I'm going to have a specific forecast for, you know, the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn. I'm hoping Bensonhurst's really in Brooklyn, but um, specific areas of, of the area based upon a lot of the different information that we're gathering from both structured and unstructured data. So, you know, how does that look? So if we take a look at all the, the data that's out there, right? Right now, a lot of the forecasting is done on a year-to-year -year basis to where it's saying, we're expecting to have this much of an uptick in, in volume, so we're gonna go ahead and, and increase the forecast by this much. So that works, and I've seen that work, and it's typically very reliable, except when you have those spikes, which you really can't explain. So what hyperlocalization does is really try and explain the spikes. So it takes a look at all different information. So it's gonna take a look at weather. It's gonna take a look at Twitter feeds. It's gonna take a look at, you know, eventful. It could take a look at Pinterest. You know, we can have Watson reading the newspaper, okay? To take a look at all of those different inputs and say, you know, normally the forecast would, would be fine, but this week it's not gonna be the case. So we, we actually did some work for a retailer where we, we took a look at that and we used the market, um, uh, actually the, the Denver market, and took a look at the spikes and you know, what was causing them and then why you know, these things were happening. One of the things we found out was that you know, one spike was because the, the Denver Broncos had just won the Super Bowl. They were, you know, had uh, their first home game. It was gonna be a beautiful day and people were tweeting how they're gonna be tailgating, right? So, that should have given everybody a, a you know, notice that, hey, you know, we need to have tailgating food, we need to have beer, we need to have hot dogs, we need to have hamburgers and all that stuff, right? But it doesn't always make it down to the forecast and it doesn't always make it down to the stores that are, that are really gonna be you know, participating in that. So it's all about being able to, to see those things and then making those changes maybe a week, maybe 10 days out to allow for you know, better forecasting and to put inventory in those areas so you're able to capture those sales. So part of the problem with that is how do you do that, right? You, know, you really don't wanna have a team of people that, that are gonna be you know, reading the newspaper, a team of people that are gonna be you know, looking at eventful and Twitter feeds. So this is where le deep learning really comes through. So this is where you, you know, Watson is, is, is so important. And not to be a commercial for Watson, but you know, we use Watson to read the newspapers and now we're starting to use Watson to really understand what those trends are and identify the trends and start to, to make decisions. So it's, it's one thing to just get the data, it's another thing to get the data and then say, hey, these things are happening, beautiful day, you know, they won the Super Bowl last year, home game, everybody's talking about it, let's stock up on, on beer and hot dog buns. And the interesting thing that we found out is, is in our studies, you know, typical forecasting was about 18% inaccurate, had about an 18% error rate. When we use just this, this forecasting model with, you know, using structured and unstructured data, we got about an 18% error rate. When we used them both together, the error rate was 1%. 
So that's, that's huge. You're really combining the two, not necessarily getting rid of the old cast forecasting model, but combining the two had a huge impact on, on the accuracy of the forecast and really be able to react to those anomalies. So, you know, which brings up the Internet of Things, all right? So the Internet of Things has been around for, for a long time, and, you know, we're starting to see more and more things, um, things um, being able to uh, be tagged now. And, you know, I was looking at uh, RFID Journal here just at, at lunchtime, and one of the things that they had said is that there's going to be a 450% four, increase in the amount of tagged products by 2021. And that's, that's four years away. I actually think it could be more. But I think we're, we're going to see a lot more in terms of tag products. And, and that's really going to help forecasting as well, because you can actually take it down to the consumer level. Um, I mean, I don't know, probably like many of you, I have a curry coffee maker. And you know, it's always a big you know, problem trying to understand, OK, how much caffeinated do we want? How much decaffeinated will we want? It would be nice if somehow the coffee maker would be able to read the pods as we went through, understand the demand, and then you know, tailor my order each month. So we're starting to see that a little bit with the Amazon Dash buttons, right, where, where if you're low on something, you hit the button, it orders something for you. Just imagine you could do away with the button and, and automatically, you know, products could be reordered based upon usage patterns that you see at home. Or like I said before, your refrigerator tells you, or your phone tells you, hey, you know, um, you have an issue with the recall of this product or you know, your chicken just went bad. So there's a lot of opportunity in there, um, potentially even seeing into the consumer's homes from, from a retailer perspective. So blockchain, um, that I think is what really is gonna bring a lot of this together. So blockchain is, is you know, fairly new. I mean, before we used to do a lot with, with EDI transactions and you know, Going back many, many years ago when I was doing a lot of work with RFID, um, when it was called Auto ID, it was about 15 years ago, uh, they talked about what was called an object naming server, an ONS. And, and this was this, this database that was supposed to exist in the sky, right? Think, think of a big cloud containing all this RFID data. And you were supposed to get access to this based upon if you're a retailer, if you're a CPG company, and, and actually be able to, to use that to track the products versus going EDI, which nobody really liked. Well, there were a lot of issues with that, you, you know, not the least of which was security, how do you keep it secure, who gets what access, how is it added, all of that. And it never really took off, right? So a lot of this has still been done with EDI or it's been done, you know, very siloed network. I think blockchain really has the opportunity to be able to kind of, get rid of all that and be able to, to establish you know, a pedigree or, or a provenance all the way from manufacturer uh, to the consumer and something that people can actually use and look up and make sure is, is accurate and secure like they're doing with, with the Bitcoin now. So what's it look like? I think you know, blockchain is going to have a lot of impact in different areas. It's going to be you know, traceability you know, in terms of recalls and be able to understand you know, where the product is. Um, many, many times I've been talking about, I think it was e-pedigree with, with, with pharma and, and how to make sure that the product um, you know, isn't counterfeit. And, and you know, near and dear to my wine, there's near and dear to my heart, they're doing that with wines too now, where, where some of the wine bottles actually have you know, um, RFID tags, you can make sure that the wine bottle is in fact genuine. So it, it's gonna help a lot with that being able to, to say, okay, where did this come from? Is it really, you know, um, uh, an actual product or, or is it, you know, counterfeit? Um, I've heard people saying, you know, this will even be able to, to, to let me know. You know, I like salmon from a specific river, so I'll make sure that this salmon is from a specific river. I'm not a big salmon fan, but I guess the salmon fans is kind of important. Um, so it's really going to revolutionize this. I think the way it does is you're getting rid of the middleman, you're getting rid of one person controlling the data, and really being able to disseminate the data, um, you know, easily across all parties with different levels of access. Okay, and then finally, I think I have a couple minutes left for questions is you know, kind of bringing this all together in terms of um, you know, what customers must do. 
or what companies must, might do. So, you know, number one, you know, put the customer first, make sure that they are the center, they have the information, and that you're using the information that they're putting out, um, you know, in terms of tweets or Pinterest or, or, or whatever, um, in order to, to really help forecast and make sure product's ready for them. You know, leverage the new technology, you know, being blockchain, IoT, and cognitive, and then, you know, really continue this digital con continuum of being able to have product available and, and using you know, the, the digital economy to, to revitalize your supply chain, you know, take costs out, and hopefully eliminate paperwork.